Hello, my name is Jackie Shapin, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in Los Angeles, California. And I specialize in treating OCD, other anxiety disorders, eating disorders, and other difficult life transitions. Um, I treat 17 year olds and up, and I am here with no CD to help support anyone out there who's struggling with OCD. I will do my best to answer any of your questions as best that I can and also be honest if I'm unsure. And I'm just really excited to be here to help clear things up for you and just help support you any way I can. Um, this isn't necessarily, this isn't therapy. Um, so if you are struggling with OCD and you are able to get a provider to support you, I highly recommend that. No CD is amazing and is a great resource for you. So I highly recommend them. Um, all right, so I'm gonna be on here for about an hour. And as your questions come in, I will, like I said, do my best to answer them. So let's see. Let's start with this one. Rohan says, coincidences keep happening and my OCD is always using this as proof that there is a evil being out there. And the coincidences are super rare as well. What do I do? Well, just a little bit of psycho ed around OCD and the gold standard of care treatment is... Um, sorry, I just like basically is it has it, it kind of depends on your beliefs, but if your beliefs start getting intertwined with your OCD, I think it's really helpful to be able to first be aware of that. Like, okay, I know that I have OCD and I maybe also believe that things are maybe meant to happen if they happen, if if that's something that you struggle with or not struggle with, but if you believe like everything happens for a reason, I can understand why you would then be more inclined to think that these coincidences are meant to be something. However, the fact that you think they're meant to prove that there's an evil being out there is probably where you want to point out, okay, I know that I have OCD and I know that part of my OCD latches on to, is there really evil or, out there or not? And when you notice that these coincidences happen and it makes you think about that obsession, I want you to remind yourself that instead of going into the spiral of see that's proof, that's proof, remember that treatment from OCD is all about facing the unknown and sitting with the discomfort of not knowing. And so can you notice, okay, there's that thought, there's that obsession, and instead respond with, you know what? I don't know. Maybe there is an evil being and maybe there isn't. And can you sit with this idea of, I'm probably never going to know. I'm never really going to be able to have proof because that's probably what you are trying to get away from when you are having compulsions. You're probably trying to get away from this feeling of not liking, not knowing and questioning. Hopefully that was helpful. Sorry, I started out. <laughs> with a bunch of pauses. All right. Susie says, hello, I've been struggling with derealization and my OCD has been focusing on it. I feel like my memories aren't my own and people I love seem unfamiliar. Will e ERP work for this? Thanks. So ERP stands for exposure response prevention. That is the gold standard of care for OCD. There are also other uh, modalities that are helpful when treating OCD along with ERP, such as mindfulness and ACT and working on self-compassion. So with derealization, what's really important is to try to accept that you have this happen and it is not necessarily dangerous. It is uncomfortable. And I would definitely do ERP if you have OCD and I can't guarantee that it will necessarily work and take away your realization. However, I think it will improve your acceptance of the unknown and the fear around your OCD 
And as you're, you get more used to feeling afraid or that fear reduces, then the derealization might along with it reduce. Because a lot of times derealization um, can be a, another way that your body is coping. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Susie, for asking this question. Ali says, hi, Jackie. I feel like treatment has helped me with understanding symptoms, but I struggle with mental compulsions and my anxiety feels super extreme with ERP. I've been having more panic attacks. So this could be an actual good thing because if you've been practicing ERP and that's why you're getting panic attacks, then I'm really proud of you for facing those fears because you are going to have more anxiety as you're doing your ERP because the whole goal of ERP is to feel anxiety and not try to do a compulsion. If you are having a lot of panic attacks and that just makes you be like, I don't want to do ERP, then you might want to look at your hierarchy with your provider. And are there things that you can do that maybe aren't as high as a 10 or what's giving a panic attack? Start with things a little bit lower on the hierarchy that give you a little less extreme anxiety so that you can start to work that muscle of feeling discomfort. And then eventually you will, you might feel um, more strength and more um, confidence in doing the harder exposures that might then give you less panic attacks. Okay, Sarah, let's see. Going back here. Lizetta, I hope that's how you say it. Lizetta, my 27-year-old son has severe contamination OCD. He is actually finally getting to start ERP with you guys tomorrow. Any suggestions for us as parents? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for your son. I'm so happy that he's getting the right help. I think being his cheerleader and validating him on how hard this is and how proud you are is a huge suggestion I would have. Um, I think being really interested in, in what he's learning and trying to learn with him would be helpful. Um, I, I think it's helpful if he comes to you and shares you what he's learning, but I wouldn't force him to do that because that also might be an exposure for him to even tell you. So I think just be supportive, be curious, um, ask if there's anything you can do to help, but, but let him know you don't want to, you know, necessarily push. Um, if he's never coming to you, I, one assumption I would make, or one thing I would try to remember about treatment from OCD, which is ERP, is if you're helping him do the compulsions, or you are giving him reassurance, or telling him, like, it's going to be okay, um, it's okay to tell him, like, treatment's going to be okay, but if you're um, reassuring him about whatever his obsessions are, that's not necessarily going to be helpful. Um, however, I don't want you to necessarily try to treat him yourself. So if he says something to you like, I'm working on reassurance, but I'm not really ready for it. Maybe let's set some type of goal. That's going to be better than you all of a sudden saying, well, I've heard I'm not supposed to do this, so I'm not doing it. Um, so I, I think what I'm really saying is, really try to have conversations and collaborate and be curious. And I think reading about ERP could be helpful. I know there's some books that are about parents and family and treatment with OCD. I can't remember the name of the author. It could be John Hirschfield or Jonathan Abramowitz. I think it's one of those or Jonathan Grayson. Any of those authors, I think I'm messing up one of the first names, but any of those authors are going to have amazing books. So Abramowitz, Grayson, and um, Hirschfield. And um, if they're one of the authors of a book about family with OCD, I like those are good ones. All right. I would love some tips for not making ERP an obsession. Am I doing this right? What is something other than ERP is working for me? I feel like I need ERP as the gold standard for recovery. Uh, so I'm a little bit confused by part of the question. I think some tips for not making ERP an obsession is really increasing your mindfulness. So the fact that you already know that 
ERP can become an obsession is already awareness. Am I doing this right? A good response is, I don't know. I'm going to do it anyway. What if something other than PA is working for me? I don't know, but I know ERP is the gold standard of care, so I'm going to keep going with that. I feel like I need ERP as the gold standard for recovery. Maybe, maybe not. It is the gold standard though. And so if I can get someone to teach me how to do that, who specializes, then that's what I'm going to do. So anytime you have a question that's most like an obsession, an amazing answer is, okay, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. I'm not going to answer this question. Those are all amazing answers to questions that you know are obsessions. And if a question starts with what if, that's a very good indicator that it's probably an obsession. How do you deal with OCD when you're having a particularly stressful day or even time causing you to go backwards in progress? How do you deal with this? I think an amazing response, <laughs> if I do say so myself, is to remember self-compassion. Self-compassion is so important in any type of recovery. And the reason why this is, is because, and it's, and it's not just my thoughts, research has proven that negative reinforcement is not as helpful or isn't helpful, especially compared to positive reinforcement or self-compassion. So being hard on yourself and beating yourself up and judging yourself is not going to have as positive as an outcome as if you are compassionate and understanding and supportive of yourself and what you're trying to do. And that can sometimes look like, you know what, I'm having a particularly stressful day. And so it might be harder for me to do what I know is best with according to ERP for my OCD. Or, you know, it stays a really stressful day. And so if I act on a compulsion, I'm going to be compassionate and understanding. Now, some people fear that this means you're going to let yourself off the hook and all of a sudden you're going to allow yourself to do all these compulsions. That's very all or nothing thinking. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's even going to happen. If you are motivated by recovery and you're so afraid of not doing it perfectly, it's very all or nothing thinking to think that if you're nice to yourself about it, they're all of a sudden just going to always do compulsions. So dealing with it, my answer is compassion, compassion, compassion. If your day is just so horrible and you're feeling like a 10, 0, 10, you're feeling like a 10 worst distress imaginable, then yeah, I don't, I'm not going to pressure you to do all these exposures and like and expect that your OCD is not going to be highly activated. No, if you're having a really stressful day, I'm going to be like, your OCD is probably going to hike up today because stress can increase OCD symptoms. And you may not be able to, you know, um, to resist all of them. So compassion is the, the short answer. And um, I might show this later, but a really great book it talks about this a lot that maybe some of you have heard is the self-compassion workbook for OCD by Kimberly Quinlan. This is an amazing book because it teaches you about how to practice self-compassion. It has research and proven things if you like that stuff. And it also is for OCD. So it's going to teach you about OCD, what it is, how to treat it, as well as how to use self-compassion in it. So this workbook by Kimberly Quinlan is really, really great. How do I deal with intrusive thoughts based on my past action? It was an uncontrollable event, but now my brain is making believe that I belong in that bad category and I feel like a bad person. So just hearing that you have this belief that you belong in a bad category or that you feel like a bad person, if you know you have OCD, then that definitely sounds like an obsession or a fear that you have of being bad. It could also, if it is an OCD or even if it is, you might also have these beliefs about yourself because of past experiences. Whatever the reasoning is for why you have this belief, I think it's important to remember that just because you have a belief doesn't mean it's true and that 
nobody is necessarily 100% bad and that your OCD often makes you think that way. No, I don't want you to give yourself reassurance, right? Like I'm not bad, I'm not bad, I'm not bad because that's reassurance. But if you have intrusive thoughts based based on a past action, there's one noticing, okay, I'm having intrusive thoughts about the past. So naming it. One way to help with obsessions is to use thought diffusion techniques. Thought diffusion techniques are things that make the thought a little bit more separated from fact or from yourself by saying something like, I'm noticing I'm having the thought or I'm having the thought that, or I'm having the intrusive thought that, or I'm noticing I'm having the thought that because it's taking away from your thoughts and reminding you thoughts are not facts. Thoughts don't always mean something. And so by saying, I'm noticing I'm having a thought, it's by saying something even like, I'm noticing that car over there, okay? Um, so again, it's it's naming it, noticing it, and then responding with, I don't know if I'm bad, maybe I am bad, maybe I'm not. Can I sit with the possibility that I am bad? Can I sit with the possibility that I don't know if I'm bad? So again, leaning into the discomfort, Because a lot of times, compulsions are about getting away from a feeling. So they say OCD is the fear disorder. So compulsions are trying to bring down your anxiety or distress. All they're trying to do is make you feel better. But it's temporary. Because if it wasn't temporary, you wouldn't have it come back over and over again like the cycle. So sitting with the discomfort is the whole goal of ERP. So can you just sit with the, the fear that comes along with being bad? And, and a way to figure out that real fear, it's not, oh, my real my core fear is being bad. It's getting to the core fear is asking yourself downward spiral questions, which you can look up online. But the downward spiral technique is, okay, what if I am bad? What, what would happen then? Or why is that so bad? And answering that, And then asking yourself, okay, well, what if that did happen? Then what would be so bad? So downward spiral questions help you get to the core fear. And you don't just ask it to yourself once. You go down, you you, you go down and you answer, you ask that question, you answer, you ask that question, and you try to get down really, really deep. And a lot of times the fear is a feeling. And sometimes it's nice to know, oh, this whole time I'm afraid of feeling something. Let's see. Um, What is the first step to take to overcome harm OCD with my baby? All right. So Angela, again, um, I hope that you have someone supporting you and that you have a provider to help you with this. The first step in overcoming harm OCD with your baby is to kind of do what I was just doing of figuring out the core fear. Now I know this sounds silly because I'm sure we can all think, well, it's kind of obvious why I wouldn't want to harm my baby, right? But there can be so many actual different responses to why it would be bad if you harmed your baby. Um, So even though it sounds obvious, and so those questions might sound just ridiculous, I still want you to try to answer them because everyone's different and the response might be different. So first figuring out what is that core fear? So, okay, let's say I do harm my baby. What's, again, I know it sounds silly, but go with me, please. What's, okay, let's say I do harm my baby. What am I afraid will happen next? Or what would happen if I did harm my baby? Whatever your response is, ask yourself the same question again. Okay, well then what if that happened? What would be so bad about that? And then keep asking yourself that question because getting to your core fear is going to be really helpful in figuring out what exposures you should be doing. An example could look like something like, um, if what are you doing? Um, avoidance can be a, a compulsion. So are you avoiding doing certain things because of the fear you're going to harm your child? And if so, what are those things you're doing? And can you slowly start doing them anyway? So for example, depending on if it's harm or pedophilia, 
you might um, not allow yourself to baby with your baby alone, or you might not allow yourself to change your child's diaper. So an exposure would be, I'm going to be alone in the room with my child, if that's a fear. Another one is, I'm going to change my baby's diaper, even though I'm afraid to. Um, it could be like, I never hug my baby because I'm afraid I'm going to strangle them. So a exposure would be, I'm going to cuddle my baby. And when I have this fear come up, I'm not going to let go and I'm going to keep hugging them. Just like, let's say there you don't change the diaper for some reason because this fear comes up. You know what? I have this fear and I'm going to do X, Y, and Z anyway. But if you see a provider, it's going to help you come up with what's called a hierarchy. So a hierarchy is when you come up with exposures that are things that are on the distress uh, ladder. So zero being no distress at all, 10 being the worst distress ever. You pick things that bring up a three, a four, a five, a six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now you don't have to go in order. Research shows that you can go in order or you can totally jump around. Both work. But if you're like, okay, I hear you telling me to change my baby's diaper. It's not that easy. Then I want you to see what other things that you could do that maybe don't give you that much anxiety. So one thing could be writing a script. Imagine that you're changing your baby's diaper and write about it and write as if your worst fear is happening. So if it feels like a 10 to do something, you can imagine it first. You could talk it through first um, as a way of exposure. And you can look up imagined exposure scripts online and get some help there or you know, talk to your provider who specializes in treating OCD. You want to make sure that they know how to do ERP. Um, and sitting with coincidences and letting it pass, now I've got a problem with magical thinking where I will make predictions and like I'm making wagers with the universe. Are these attributed to OCD? Yes, they are. And I want to reassure, but from a psycho-ed standpoint, yes, magical thinking is a type of theme for OCD. So magical thinking is when you think, when you believe that your thoughts, um, magical thinking is when you think, you believe that thinking something means it's gonna happen. So magical thinking is like, oh my God, I just thought about what if that car crashes? Magical thing thinking would think would be, oh my God, I just thought that car's going to crash. I bet it's going to crash. I'm such a bad person. So it's this belief that you can think things into existence or it's called thought action fusion. You actually think that your thoughts are going to create a behavior and action and they're not. So magical thinking, yes, is an OCD theme. Let's see. Oh, good, Allie. Thank you. How do you know if it's ROCD or if it's real? So again, this is something that I can't answer because it really depends on the person and what's going on. What I can say that our OCD relationship OCD, a lot of people will say they have it because they have anxiety around the relationship. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily OCD related. Um, so I highly recommend reading about ROCD um, so that you understand a little bit more of what it sounds like. Um, and a couple of examples, ROCD a lot of times focuses on, um, is this the right person or not? How do I know if this is real love or not? Um, uh, ROCD can also focus on things that, um, it can focus on things that are, I'm going to say superficial, but I, I don't know if that's the appropriate word, but sometimes it can latch on to, I just don't think he's tall enough and, and hint, like, I just don't know if I'm attracted to him or not. Um, so it can kind of latch onto that type of thing. Sometimes RSV can also sound like worrying you're cheating when you're not really cheating. Um, how do I say this? So for instance, um, you rationally, you know, you have not cheated, but you still worry that you're cheating 
or it can be like, oh, I smiled at this guy across the room. And then later being like, oh my God, that was so wrong of me. Am I a bad girlfriend because I smiled at this person? Does that mean I cheated? Am I a horrible person? So it, so it can sound similar to that. Now, if what I said does not fit, that does not mean that necessarily like, okay, I don't have it. But those are just some examples of what it can sound like. Okay. ROCD can be tricky though, because when people learn about ROCD, a lot of times they will self-diagnose. And when they're having worry or just anxiety about the relationship, they say, oh, well, I have ROCD. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's really just anxiety. And it's very common to have anxiety in relationships. ROCD is very real, though. So, again, that's why I'd want you to really talk to someone and share with them what's going on. Um, Because, unfortunately, I don't know the details. And so I can't really give you that answer. How do I deal with staring OCD and obsessing about that I need a nose job? I spend hours a day researching rhinoplasty places. Thank you so much for bringing this up. So when it comes to things about physical appearance, it could be body dysmorphic disorder. And body dysmorphic disorder or BDD it's helpful to find a specialist who specializes in OCD but and who does ERP, but I would also make sure that they know how to treat body dysmor- body dysmorphic disorder specifically. Um, because you want to make sure that they you just want to make sure that they've worked with you before. Um, but basically, easier said than done, which is why I'd want you to see a, a specialist and get a therapist. But it would basically be, um, can I limit the staring, you know, if it's in the mirror? So if I normally spend five hours a day in the mirror, I can only, I'm going to bring that down to three hours. So like if I spend five hours a day looking at my nose every single day, can I take one day off? If that's too much, okay, can I bring it down to three hours a day? So can I time myself? Can I, can I? Can I time myself? Can I schedule when I do it? So I'm only allowed to stare at my nose at one o'clock and maybe five o'clock. So setting limits around it to lessen it and setting limits so that you have more power over it. Okay. So for instance, if you set times, like I'm only allowed to look at my nose at noon, then let's say you're looking at your nose in the morning that first you go the awareness, like, oh my God, I'm in the mirror looking at my nose. You know what? I can't do that right now. I can do it at one o'clock though. Okay. Um, It doesn't necessarily mean a hundred percent avoiding the mirrors and covering them up because that could become avoidance. But if it's, if you don't have a fear of looking in the mirror, like if you have a fear of looking in the mirror, then look in the mirror. But if your fear is like, I don't, I I can't not look at it. then that's when you want to lessen looking at it. The other thing is, Researching is a form of figuring it out or rumination. It's a compulsion. So can you notice when you're researching and can you, can you pause? Can you stop? Can you say, oh my God, I am researching rhinoplasty. That's not helpful. I know that's my OCD. So I'm going to research something else. Okay. That's like a start. Hi, I'm dealing with harm OCD and find myself afraid to get mad or into arguments. I avoid any type of confrontation and try to listen and agree more than anything. Any tips on how to apply ERP? This is great. So you have harm OCD, so you're afraid of harming, I'm guessing, others. I think maybe it's yourself, but either way, you're afraid of harm, like harming something or someone or yourself. It sounds like your compulsion is avoidance, right? I'm avoiding getting mad. I'm, uh, you said I avoid any type of confrontation. So if you're like not seeing people or avoiding confrontation or noticing you're agreeing when you don't agree, that's all a compulsion. That's avoidance. So how to apply ERP? It's I'm going to confront. I'm going to give my opinion. I might get mad and I'm going to let my gut myself get mad. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say go get into arguments on purpose because I just, well, you could actually, I mean, that would maybe be actually a good, a good exposure, but it could start out by saying, I don't know if I'm going to get mad or not. 
I'm afraid I'm going to get mad or not. However, I'm going to face that fear, go confront, and I'm just going to see what happens. Okay. It's also figuring out that fear of what if I do get mad? What am I afraid is going to happen? So great. But Rob, your question is great because you kind of outed yourself in a good way by saying avoid. So you know avoidance is your compulsion. So how can you stop avoiding things that get you mad or get you into arguments? Or identifying what the harm OCD is and not avoiding whatever that might be. So if you're, a, you know, um, I guess avoidance is a big one for harm OCD. But I, again, I want to hear a little bit more. But basically, things that aren't avoiding. Again, if this sounds like impossible, I, then I want you to imagine confronting and getting mad and getting to an argument. So imagine, and then imagine your fear coming true. Imagine harming someone, which is going to bring up the anxiety, which I want you to sit with. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. What's your favorite part of leading clients through ERP? Um, I love that. I think my favorite part of leading clients through ERP is seeing, seeing the relief that comes later. I think I like leading it because I see that it works. And so it's so heartwarming and amazing to see someone who's suffering suffer less because of this process. And I know it works. Um, I, I also like it because it can be creative and it's collaborative. You know yourselves better than me. And so you're actually going to know what's going to be more anxiety provoking for yourself than I am. So it's a very collaborative process. If I give you exposures and they don't really give you anxiety, then that's not good homework. And the only way for us to know if it's good homework is you being honest about what gives you anxiety and what would be really scary. Um, so I love that it's collaborative. I love that it works. Um, I also think everyone that I've met that struggles with this are amazing and intelligent and um, are good, good, awesome people. How do you start limiting ruminating? All right, so rumination can be spiraling with your thoughts, thinking something over and over again. I also like to say that I think ruminating is also, I also call it figuring it out. So it's when you're going over something in your head because you think thinking about it or figuring it out is gonna really have an answer. Um, all of those things are rumination. How do you start awareness? And I know I say this a lot, but the first thing is becoming aware that you are doing it. So, and that can look like going in the spiral and being like, oh my God, I'm noticing I'm spiraling or, um, yeah, I'm noticing I'm trying to figure it out. I'm doing a compulsion, just naming it, noticing it and naming it is how you start it. Okay. Um, just to go a little bit further with it. Once you name it, it's like, okay, well then what do I do? So name it and then question how you're feeling. So if you're like, okay, notice I'm ruminating, try to stay out of that rumination by being like, okay, notice I'm ruminating. I'm going to check in with myself. How do I feel right now that I'm ruminating? Where do I feel it in my body? How do I feel emotionally? Because that is taking you out of the ruminating and it's putting you into what you're really feeling, which is probably what you're avoiding by ruminating. I know I have OCD and honestly, I just want to ask if I never got treated for OCD, is it worth it? Wait, I know I have OCD and I honestly just want to ask if I never got treated for OCD, is it worth it regardless of how I feel? I really just wanted to understand. I'm so sorry, Zach. I don't know if I understand the question. I really want to help answer it for you. If I never got traded for OCD, is it worth it regardless of how I feel? Oh, I don't know what you mean. Please, Zach, can you ask that again a little bit differently so that I can uh, come back and answer for you? Because I really would like to. How common is the fear of going crazy, losing control? When I have a hard time with my harm OCD, I get scared that I will no longer be able to cope and break or go crazy. 
So Nicole, I don't want to reassure you. Um, but this is a theme. So this, this is OCD um, or this is an OCD theme. And when you get scared that you're going to break, I want you to, um, well, one thing you can respond to is, yeah, maybe I won't be able to cope. And, but maybe I also don't need to cope because if I don't cope, it means I'm just sitting with these feelings. Maybe I will break. Maybe I will go crazy. And what is my fear? Why am I so scared of going crazy and losing control? Um, but this, but this is this is a theme. Um, so I hate to reassure, but I also, in case you've never had this question answered before, this is a theme. Yes, ERP helps with all anything with OCD related. ERP also helps with anxiety. ERP also helps with um, treatment of eating disorders. Um, but yes, existential OCD is a OCD theme. And ERP helps with all themes. So let's say you have one theme and you use ERP and then all of a sudden another theme pops up because this happens. You'll be, once you understand ERP and you notice another theme coming in, what's great is you're like, okay, this is OCD. Doesn't matter what the theme is, the treatment is the same. Uh, let's see, bad hand. My recent OCD revolving around guilt of not being able to refrain myself completely watching porn images gifts. I'm not an addict, but I want to ensure I never involve unethical acts. I'm not sure if I understand this question. Um, my recent OCD revolving around guilt of not being able to refrain myself completely watching porn images. Um, Let's see. I might, yeah, sorry. My brain, my brain is something today because this might be super clear and I'm not reading it correctly. My recent OCD revolving around guilt of not being able to refrain myself completely watching porn images gifts. I'm not an addict, but I'm John Um, How to confront. I, I first want to ask you what this fear is. What if you are an addict? What if um, you do watch these porn images? Um, what is the fear? Now, if you're talking about um, something that is child related um, and it's just a fear of watching, but you aren't watching, then again, if it's OCD using ERP, if it's not OCD and you enjoy this or you are doing that, then that's something different. And so I would want you to, again, seek out a therapist to really be able to understand what, what's going on, okay? Oh, the guilt. Jenny, I have a constant fear of having a heart attack. I want it to stop. All right, so I always say rule out medical one time. So if you already know that your heart is great and the doctor has said, your heart is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Then I don't want you to go back. And I want you to know, okay, this is a fear of mine. And checking it out all the time and going to the doctor is not going to be helpful. And so I'm going to have to sit with the discomfort of like this just being a fear. Wanting it to stop and trying to like do something to get rid of it, that's going to make it actually worse. And so that's why challenging your thinking or reassuring yourself um, or rationalizing, those things are actually going to give you temporary relief, but not long term. So I want you to try to find acceptance. So you know what? I don't like that I'm having that I have a fear of having a heart attack. I don't I don't need to like that I have that fear. I don't. However, I can I can accept it. So acceptance is not liking or loving or even being okay with something. It's just facing reality for what it is instead of what you want it to be. So can you start to accept that you have a fear of having a heart attack? And can you have compassion that 
man, this sucks. And this is really painful to have so much fear about having a heart attack. Can you do that? I'm gonna go, let's see. Oh, wow, sorry, there's a lot that I haven't gotten to. Should you apologize to your partner for anxiously exploding on them and asking them for reassurance? Should you apologize to your partner for exploding on them and asking them for reassurance? I'm not sure if I'm just reading it directly, there's nothing wrong with apologizing for exploding on your partner for them not reassuring you. So what I'm understanding by this question is I have OCD. Um, my partner knows about it. They know it's not helpful to give me reassurance. And, and when I ask for it and they don't give it to me, I get really mad at them. And should I apologize to them for flipping out on them for not giving me reassurance? Yeah, if you're able to kind of notice like, oh man, I really shouldn't be yelling at them about this. They're actually trying to help me. Then I, I do get apologizing if, if I'm reading it correctly. All right, I'm gonna skip around. So I try to get to other people. Oh, I don't know what to ask. I guess how can ERP help with obsessive thoughts or what I'm getting into? I suppose I never tried ERP and I'm just wondering about the process. Oh, Zach, I, please don't apologize. Um, again, I could totally just be having a brain fart and not reading questions <laughs> well today. Um, so no, no apology necessary at all. Um, so the re ERP can help with obsessive thoughts because, uh, and what are you getting into? ERP is going to bring up anxiety, but that's good because the more anxious you can let yourself feel, easy it's going to become to, to sit with it. And then the faster it's going to pass, ERP isn't going to get rid of your fear it's going to help you accept and sit with that fear. It's going to help those obsessive thoughts because the skills, the skills are going to lessen your obsessive thoughts over time. They're not going to get rid of them, but they're going to get, help you have a better relationship with your obsessive thoughts and compulsions. So they're not going to get rid of the thoughts, but they can't, ERP will help you get rid of the compulsions. Um, and if you've never tried it, you're not going to lose anything by trying it other than maybe calling out your OCD a little bit. And, and I'm saying that because it's helpful to externalize your OCD. You are not your OCD. You struggle with OCD. So if you're afraid to try it, lean in and face that fear because that is what ERP is all about. And you can't knock it if you don't try it. So I want you to try it and then, and then, you know, decide there's no harm in trying something new, even if you don't like it, it's an experience, it's learning. So I want you to try ERP, um, especially because it, it works. It really does work. Can OCD be focused on single events in the past? Yes, yes, it can. Is there a type of magical thinking OCD where people are worried if they had a precognitive dream or vision that later came true? I tend to get this and it creeps me out because I deal with coincidences. Oh, Faith, I wonder if you were here in the beginning. We were talking about this a little bit. Um, so this... We did talk about magical thinking and magical thinking is the idea that if you think something that it can come true and an easy explanation of why magical thinking is not possible is because I right now I'm thinking that I would like a million dollars and unfortunately that's not coming true. Um, so magical thinking is this idea that your thoughts can turn in that bring about actions and they don't. Um, so if, if you're noticing that you have a dream and you're obsessing about whether or not that dream is going to come true, yes, that might be an obsession. What are you doing about it? What are the compulsions? And can you resist doing those compulsions?
Oh. Um, Jason, I have an irregular heartbeat that causes me anxiety. How can I get to the bottom of what the ultimate fear is to successfully use ERP? I'm not afraid of the irregular heartbeat itself. You're not afraid of the irregular heartbeat, but you're, but it causes you anxiety. Oh, so so I want you to look up downward spiral, or downward question technique or downward arrow technique. But basically, um, if you go back a little bit, I answered this earlier. But basically, what you're going to ask yourself is, why do I get anxiety about my irregular heartbeat? And answer that question. If it's, yeah, answer that question. Then whenever you answer that question, I want you to ask back to that new answer, well, what if that did happen? What would be so bad about that? And keep asking that question until you really feel like you can't answer it. And even when you feel like you can't answer it, try. Because people think they get to the core fear when it's really even deeper. Uh, one thing I do want to say, though, is I'm assuming that you have an irregular heartbeat and, and your physician has, um, I don't know, has, has said there isn't anything they can do about it. And that's why you're having to kind of sit with this anxiety. So I'm assuming that you've ruled out medically there's something that needs to happen. And I'm saying that just because it is my job to um, – protect and make sure everyone's safe and ruling out medical is, is important, but just one time. I don't want it to become an obsession to go there. Janice, what do you do when you feel an OCD episode starting? Need help with strategies to help avoid the point of no return. All right. So one thing is to accept that you might get to that point. And it sounds like maybe you've gotten to that point. Um, I wonder if it's also fear. I, I wonder if a fear is getting to this point of no return and what does that really mean? Um, one way, it, if you feel an episode starting, that sounds like you already have awareness and you can feel it. So it's noticing it and naming it. I notice that an episode's going to start and instead of thinking, oh my God, no, 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 no. How do I, how do I get rid of it? How do I push it away? It's all right. Here we go. Let's start this episode. Let's see how bad it can get. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that's that's going to help you to lean in and be like, you know what? I'm not, even if you are afraid to, to talk to your OCD and be like, you know what? I'm not afraid of you. Maybe I'm a little afraid, but you know what? Even if I am afraid, I'm going to have an episode. I'm going to start an episode and I'm probably going to X, Y, and Z. So it's facing that fear. Ah, uh, Jason, yes, it's not medically a problem. Perfect. So then, yeah, Jason, go go with what I shared. Ah, uh, Nicole, thank you so much. I love these lives. Uh, what state are you licensed to work? Oh, thanks, Nicole. So I am in California. Um, I live in Los Angeles, but because of this amazing virtualness, um, I can treat anyone in California. Um, that's, yeah, that's where I'm at. So I, I'm licensed in California, but I can't treat you if you're not in California, unfortunately. If your partner doesn't know you have OCD and you keep asking them for reassurance if they're still interested in the relationship, this is a good example of our OCD. You should you apologize the next day for these anxious behaviors? Okay. I don't know if this is going to answer your question exactly, but... Instead of asking for reassurance and then asking about, do I apologize? How can you lessen asking for the reassurance in the first place? Okay. So yeah, the apology or not, I think is not what's important. I think what's important is how to reduce asking them for reassurance. If you know that this is OCD and you have relationship OCD and you have this awareness that you're asking them for reassurance, how can you reduce ask, asking them for reassurance? Um, a start could, oh, when your partner doesn't know. Okay. One is what's keeping you from telling them? I'm not saying you need to tell them. I think it's a personal choice. However, 
if this is someone that you see being in your life for a long time and you feel safe with them or you trust them or whatever that might be, what would it be like to tell them? And the only reason I'm saying this is because if they don't know about reassurance seeking, they might continue to enable you. Now, if you're like, no way, Jose, I don't want to tell them. And this is maybe a new relationship or whatever the reason is you don't want to tell them. Then because they're not going to be able to help you hold you accountable because they don't know, that's where you really have to work on exposures and figure out with, with the therapist or by reading like a workbook, how can I lessen asking them these questions? Find out the core fear. Imagine what would happen if you didn't ask. Sitting with that anxiety of not asking them, that's all important. Asking them for reassurance all the time and even apologizing all the time can be something that pushes someone away. Um, and, and that's what's really sad about OCD is that sometimes obsessions or compulsions can actually get in the way of relationships. And that's why getting help is really, really important because I know that I'm sure you cherish these relationships and they mean a lot to you. Let's see. Michaela, is it possible to do ERP for contamination OCD during this time in the world? All my compulsions just feel just so justified right now compared to the past. It is totally possible to, to do ERP for contamination OCD. Um, I get that they feel justified right now, but that doesn't mean that they are justified. And even if they are justified, that doesn't mean that you can't still do ERP. Um, when COVID first came around and this was an even more common question, a lot of our therapist answers were do what the CDC says and nothing more. So I'm wondering, I, I'm guessing that your compulsions that you think are justified. I wonder if they really aren't because if you pick one, um, source, like that's like the CDC, the CDC is probably not going to justify all of your compulsions. It's probably going to tell you the best practices. And can you stick to that and, and anything more can you expose yourself to? Let's see. Armin, that's the right way, right? I'm not sure what you're referencing. Let's see. Can I access treatment for my 11 year old in New Zealand? Thanks. So a couple of things you can do, uh, reach out to no CD and ask them if, if no CD can help you in, in New Zealand. And I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Um, so reach out to no CD. Um, another place you can look is the IOCDF website. IOCDF stands for International OCD Foundation. And there's a, a place on the website where you can look for providers in your area and search and see if there's anyone in New Zealand. Um, but call, if you're kind of like, what? Call no CD or email no CD. And even if they can't help you, they can help you find resources or references. I really hope they're able to get help and I love they're even asking this because that means I know you're going to help your 11-year-old. Okay. Oh, please, let's see. Armin, please check my previous age. Armin, hello, I'm trying to do... Oh, uh, let's see. Hello, I'm trying to not do any compulsions altogether for the first few days of anxiety. However, better now. It is like thought is fading. Looks like exercise and resisting is W. Maybe it's working. Sorry, I don't know. I, I don't know how to fully answer your questions. Um, but if you're not doing compulsions and you're noticing it went from huge anxiety to feeling better, then that sounds good. But again, because I don't know your story, I don't know if there is a, a part of this that I'm understanding that maybe isn't helpful. 
I'm 15. Let's see. Uh-oh. Sorry, I think my computer's getting slow. Uh -oh. Okay, so I'm aware of the time. I'm also aware that my battery is no longer charging correctly on my computer. And I'm going to try to lean into this feeling of worry. Um, and let's see, really quick, because I put this out there. I'm 15 and my family isn't supportive when I ask them for help. Any tips or advice? No CD. Um, IOCDF has a, um, there's kit, there's conferences you can attend. There's books you can get if you are not able to get support from a therapist. There's actually a conference on Saturday, um, OCD, Southern California OCD, um, SoCal OCD has a conference on this Saturday, the 30th, um, where it's a great place you can go and learn all about OCD. Um, so look up SoCal OCD at a conference on April 30th on Saturday is one place, but check out no CD. If your family isn't supportive, that doesn't mean that you can't get the help. Okay. Um, no CD has a ton of free support groups. So money is also something that can't stop you from also finding support. All right. So, oh, yeah, my, my um, computer's charging now. So I am aware of the time, this way I am going to have to get off. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to get to all of your questions. Hopefully I shared some good resources to continue. Um, if you have a question for me or um, want to reach out to me, um, my website is JackieShapenTherapy.com. So my name is at the bottom of the screen. Um, so J-A-C-K-I-E-S-H-A-P-I-N Therapy. Dot com. You can also find me on Instagram at, at Jackie Shape and Therapy. Um, I'm going to start posting more. I, I went through a dry spell, but there's some things on there about OCD. Um, so that's one way to find me. And then again, like I said, this Saturday, April 30th through SoCal, um, OCD SoCal or SoCal OCD, there's going to be a conference. Um, IOCDF, I think, org is an amazing organization. Um, no CD is amazing. So if today wasn't helpful or you want some more, um, even if it was helpful, um, please continue getting support. Um, there's a podcast called Your Anxiety Toolkit by Kimberly Quinlan. That's also amazing. Um, and I know that, I'm not, yeah, there's amazing podcasts and a lot of stuff. So if you need more res reference uh, resources or you're not really knowing what I'm saying, DM me on Instagram and I can, I can help you. So again, thank you so much for being here. And if you were able to find this, this place, then I know that you are resourceful and you can find the right help. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Oh, thanks, Eric. Love Australia. All right. Bye.